is my honor and privilege to introduce today's keynote speaker for the 2022 Eastern Buddhist League Conference. Um, we have Reverend Dr. Takashi Miyagi, who is um, multi-talented. He is the minister at the Southern Alameda Buddhist, Buddhist Temple. He's also uh, the associate professor at the Institute Institute of Buddhist Studies. Um, he is now the main uh, Jodo Shinshu or Shin Buddhist scholar in residence at IBS. And uh, before that, Reverend Miyagi was assigned to the Tacoma Buddhist Temple. Uh, before that, he was in Japan at Nukoku University, where, where he got his master's and doctorate in Shin Buddhist Studies. I understand he was there in Japan for eight years, um, studying and living. Uh, before that, he was he graduated the Institute of Buddhist Studies and undergrad at uh, UC Berkeley, a small school there in Northern California. Um, my alma mater, also, by the way. Um, but Reverend Miyagi comes from a ministerial family. Um, his father, his uncle were BCA ministers. I knew bo um, both of them and actually was in Japan at the same time both of they were studying at Yukoku. Um, and further back than that is his grandfather was um, also a teacher at the professor at the Institute of Buddhist Studies. His grandfather was a Buddhist scholar and a Honganji Kangaku. Um, the highest ranking uh, Honganji scholar. Um, they are the Kangaku is what we know as, I guess we, in slang terms, we call the heresy board, but they are the maintainers of the doctrine. Um, but Reverend Miyagi brings a great perspective, a great joy, a great sense of humor to his to his understanding of Buddhism and Jodo Shinshu, and we certainly look forward to his talk this morning. With that, Takashi, please. Good morning. Thank you very much, Miyamura Sensei. Thank you very much for that uh, nice introduction. I'm very humbled. Thank you very much for um, allowing me to have the um, the opportunity and and the the privilege to be able to uh, speak with you all today. Um, there are a lot of new faces here today, I think, and, and so it's a real. Uh, honor for me uh, to be able to uh, speak today. So thank you very much. I'm going to go ahead and uh, and share um, my screen share. By the way, if uh, my mic cuts out or some something happens and can't see the screen or anything, please feel free to um, let me know um, at, right away. Um, that way I can kind of adjust it because you know sometimes what I think I, I everybody is seeing is not what everybody is actually seeing or actually hearing. So um, please let me know about that. And I'll be glancing from time to time over here because I have a, dis a separate display here that's um, showing what I am showing you guys. So, okay, let me just get myself situated here. Okay, so I'd like to kind of just jump right into it. Um, today's title um, for my talk today is um, Staying Connected Through Amida Buddha's Great Aspiration. And this is um, <clears throat> um, largely connected with uh, the, the overarching kind of theme for this, uh, this conference, which is Dharma Friends um, staying connected. So, you know, what does it mean for Dharma Friends to stay connected? As, as I was sitting and thinking about, you know, this issue, um, I think there's a number of ways that I could have uh, approached this. Um, but for me, um, staying connected is about having this feeling of understanding and being understood. And uh, in this growing tech world, you know, it's, it's, it's very interesting, you know, we have all sorts of information that can be uh, knowledge that can give, give, be given to us, you know, right at the click of a button, right? Um, and in the convenience of our own homes, right? Um, many of you will have much more knowledge of this than I will, but um, I saw this, uh, this recent news segment about the, the metaverse. Um, I, I'm sure many of you are very uh, familiar with what this is, um, but uh, it's about these tech companies, you know, investing a lot of time and money towards, towards this metaverse in which we create this kind of virtual reality. And as I was watching this, this narrator explain what happens, um, she essentially creates this avatar of herself 
and carries out her day right in this in this metaverse so she has you know meetings with her colleagues at her company who also have their you know separate avatars and so each person you know makes up their own kind of avatar you know as if you know like it's like a nintendo wii game or something right and they choose their own hair color right and their, their skin color what to wear in the metaverse you know how they look you know even the body type that they want they can choose all of these things and they can go to the restaurants and, and bars and socialize here in this in this virtual reality. So if you think about this, you know, they could start, they could do anything, you know, they could shop for clothes, they could buy insurance, you know, taking your kids to school, right? All of these things are done via this, this metaverse, right? And so, you know, my mind at the age of Okay, let's say above 30. But at uh, at this age, you know, it's 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 already mind boggling, right? So in 30 years, you know, I, I you know, I can't I can barely comprehend what's going on with this right now. You know, what's gonna happen in 30 years from now? It's gonna be really hard to keep up with this very, very different world, I think. Um and you know, I I'm I'm personally I have this um I'm terrified of sharks. <laughs> and uh, and it's attributable to the um, 1980s film um Jaws. Um, and everybody keeps telling me the shark looks fake. Don't worry about it. The shark looks fake, you know, but then, but essentially in this, you know, virtual reality, right. Um, I think that would, that would be really terrifying, right. <laughs> but anyway, you get to see that, you know, how, what I'm talking about with this metaverse uh, being um, this virtual reality, a, a, a complete separate world. Right. And I was, uh, as I was talking with my colleague, who's a Buddhist um, scholar and um, um, he, he wrote this book with a bunch of other Buddhist scholars. And one of the other scholars, uh, wrote that um, the, with the internet and, and uh, being online and now especially with this metaverse as we think about that, it's, it's essentially, you know, this world of Saha within the world of Saha, right? It's the world of delusion within the world of delusion. It's kind of like delusion 2.0, right? Uh, so within this world of chaos and confusion, we've created kind of another uh, world of, of chaos and, and con confusion. And so, you know, I'm not trying to give you a bleak outlook on life. Um, I'm merely just trying to point out that um, this world of confusion has existed since the beginning was passed, and it will continue on, right? And so then, um, for us uh, living in this day and age, you know, what, what is a solution that we can come to? Where can we find, you know, solace and, and respite, haven and, and comfort, or simply just peace of mind, you know? Um, this is something I kind of would like to um, uh, take up today. Okay, oops, I forgot to show this introduction. Basically, that's the slide, what I was just talking about. But I'd like to move on to the next uh, section here. So first, I'd like to talk about Amida Buddha's uh, primal vow, Midano Hongang. Okay. So I'd like to shift gears here and talk about the, the essence of Jodo Shinshu Buddhism, because I think the conversation begins here. Um, we've all heard of Amida Buddha and, and the Buddha's vow uh, that liberates all sentient beings, correct? Um, in, a, in a quick overview, I'd like to talk about the story of Amida Buddha and what the significance of the primal vow uh, means. <clears throat> so let's look uh, specifically at the larger sutra today. Okay. So here it explains that um, in this story of, of, that's given in the larger sutra, there is a bodhisattva who went by the name Dharmakara, right? Who comes to see the human condition as one of suffering with never a chance for true spiritual liberation. Then in order to become a Buddha, Dharmakara pronounces 48 specific vows of which there are five that are particularly important. So Bodhisattva Dharmakara fulfills his vows through eons of practice and eventually becomes Amida Buddha. And of these five vows, the 18th vow is the most central, also known as the primal vow. Here it expounds that Amida Buddha will set forth the spiritual liberation of all sentient beings by, by way of having them come to entrust in and recite the name of Amida Buddha. And this name, also known as the Nembutsu in Japanese, translates to refuge in Amida Buddha. So next, the um, 12th and 13th vows establish the significance of the name of Amida Buddha. So the name Amida is actually the combination of two names, Amitayus, which means immeasurable life, and Amitabha, which means immeasurable light. So Amida's features of having infinite light and life is analogous to having infinite wisdom and compassion. So this light is associated with wisdom, and then compassion is associated with uh, life. Okay. 
So Amida Buddha is the quintessential embodiment of the ultimate ideal of the Mahayana Bodhisattva path, which is the fulfillment of wisdom and compassion. Okay. So moving on to the 17th vow, um, here it stipulates that the innumerable Buddhas of the 10 quarters come to praise the virtues of Amida Buddha, known as the phrase Namo Amida Butsu. When an individual invokes the name of Amida Buddha by saying the phrase Namo Amida Butsu, that person joins the assembly of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas that are one in praising Amida. And finally, the 11th vow uh, explains that because the path to Buddhahood has been established for all, if sentient beings awaken to this roadway to spiritual liberation, one is assured the attainment of enlightenment by way of birth in the Pure Land. Thus, birth in the Pure Land is itself nirvana. So there's a common phrase that's used in Japanese, ojo soku jōbutsu, ojo soku jōbutsu. Ojo is birth in the Pure Land, soku means is, and then jōbutsu means attaining Buddhahood, i.e. nirvana, okay, attaining nirvana. So birth in the Pure Land is itself nirvana. So just to quickly review then <clears throat> the five vows, the 17th vow is the name of Amida connects all beings to the world of truth. 18th is all beings will be liberated from suffering through relying on this name. The 11th is that because of the name, we will be born in the Pure Land and attain Buddhahood, the final goal of Buddhism. And then the 12th and 13th, which is we will become one with the principle of infinite wisdom and compassion of light and uh, life. Okay. So this is the Jodo Shinshu teaching kind of in its bare bones, which is expounded in the larger sutra by and clarified by Shinai Shonin. But the five vows, vows can be further consolidated uh, or collapsed into the 18th vow. And that's the following where it states this. Okay. So if when I attain Buddhahood, the sentient beings of the 10 quarters who with sincere and entrusting heart, aspire to be born in my land and say my name even 10 times, should not be born there. May I not attain the perfect enlightenment. Excluded are those who commit the five grave offenses and those who slander the right dharma. So that's in the Bhusetsu Muryo Jukyo. Okay. So in a nutshell, when sentient beings uh, contemplate on, entrust in, and recite the name of Amida Buddha, they will attain spiritual liberation by being born in the realm of truth. And I do want to draw your attention to the last part that's underlined here on this slide, which is known as the exclusion clause. And here it explains that there are people excluded from the pure land. So at, fa at face value, um, this might seem really harsh. You know, why are there people excluded, right? Um, however, <clears throat> as the masters, Pure Line masters, Tan Luan and Shandao explain, these are warnings not to be slanderous of the Buddha Dharma. Because if one is slanderous of the Buddha Dharma, despite the fact that the path to spiritual liberation is provided for all beings without exception, these individuals choose to disparage and reject this truth. So how can one resolve the issue of suffering when that person rejects the solution to the problem? You know, it's kind of like a, a sick person who is given the medicine to get better from the specific illness that the individual has, but that person rejects to drink the medicine. Right? It doesn't matter that the medicine is provided and that it, it's, it's the cure to the illness. In the end, the individual has to decide to accept that medicine in order to get better. So the exclusion clause is the Buddha warning the sentient beings not to reject the medicine that is provided for them. It's Amida Buddha saying, if you reject this, you're not going to get better kind of thing, right? Uh, but it's only a warning, as Tanwan and Shandao explain. But even these individuals, if they commit these evil deeds, but ultimately have a spiritual transformation, or what's known as eshin in Japanese, and awaken to the Buddha's calling voice, they too will attain spiritual liberation. And we have to keep in mind that Shina Shonin, um, he never cited the 18th vow um, um, without this exclusion clause. He always included this exclusion clause, okay? Honen Shonin might have um, cut out the exclusion clause or um, other Pure Line masters might not include the exclusion clause. But Shina Shonin always made it a point to cite the 18th vow in its entirety. And he does this um, with, uh, in a very intentional way. It's to say that he himself considered himself at one point amongst this group 
but also that um, it's the understanding that all sentient beings are provided this path uh, to spiritual liberation. So he saw this as indispensable uh, in the 18th vow. So we translate the 18th vow, uh, known as Honggang, as primal vow, because this is the underlying vow that embraces all beings and provides for them a path to spiritual liberation. It's here that Amida Buddha became Amida, right? And precisely because the Buddha saw the need for a path for the ordinary being to be able to have a way out of this world of suffering. So if there wasn't such a thing as the ignorant sentient beings or the, uh, the sentient beings who are caught in affliction and suffering, then there would be no need for Amida Buddha. Amida Buddha exists precisely because sentient beings exists, exist. And this is known as the Imotsushin in uh, Japanese. So at the beginning of today's talk, I mentioned that for me, staying connected um, as the theme of this conference is, uh, um, uh, is, is about having this feeling of understanding and being understood. So what if we could live in a world where we, we can feel accepted as we, are, as we are, where we can understand others and can be understood by the world? What does that look like? Well, I'd like to share with you an example of one such person who was able to briefly experience what it feels like to understand as well as be understood. I'd like to show you a, a video, a short, very, very short video. Um, and there is a person by the name of uh, Muharram who is uh, hearing impaired. And a team of people learn to speak sign language to let him know of a service that um, Samsung uh, will provide to cater to this demographic. So yes, it's, it's a commercial, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to promote any kind of a uh, uh, brand here, but um, the impact of this commercial is pretty great nonetheless. So I'd like to go ahead and share this with you. Okay, can everybody see this? Okay, great. Oh, sorry.
Great. So uh, from this video, uh, what we were able to see is that the hearing impaired individual was able to communicate with the world in a much easier way because everyone was able to speak his language. So the world for him, at least for a brief moment, uh, was a place with no barriers. Muharram was able to experience a world in which he felt accepted as he was, where he could easily understand and be understood in a world uh, that he was in. And this is how we can stay connected uh, with the world. We try to create a world that tries to emulate an environment where we can understand and accept others and where they can understand and accept us. So I'd like to go ahead and share screen again here. Okay, so from a Jodo Shinshu standpoint, we can stay connected if we pursue our spiritual selves. When we awaken to the world of absolute truth, we can feel accepted and understood as we are because Amida Buddha embraces us as we are. Thus, the language of the Pure Land is spoken not necessarily with words. Rather, we converse in it through the depths of our hearts. We converse with the world around us, that, that with truth itself, through compassion. And I will explain um, this again towards the end of today's talk. So before the YouTube video, um, uh, I gave you a doctrinal explanation of the path to spiritual liberation as explained in the larger sutra, uh, the basis of which is the primal vow. But what does it mean for us in concrete terms, right? Why should we care about this, in other words, right? And what, dif what difference does this make in our lives, in other words? So I'd like to kind of address that um, issue next here. So Amida Buddha is both immeasurable light and life as mentioned, right? So light is associated with wisdom on the one hand and then life is associated with compassion on the other hand. I'm going to leave, a, uh, leave aside light and wisdom for today because I believe that you know, this gets discussed a lot and uh, you know, um, it's kind of, we can kind of make that connection with light and wisdom with religion, right? A lot of religions use candles and use light, right? Uh, to, uh, in, in, their, in their theme of uh, representing what truth is. But um, I wanna talk about this uh, life and compassion side a little bit more. Why life? You know, what, what is it about life? What does that mean actually? Uh, what is the significance of immeasurable life? Does it mean that when we awaken to Buddhahood that we somehow become, you know, immortals or something like that? Um, that when we awaken to Xinjing, we somehow live forever, right? Of course not, right? That's not the case. Um, but I'd like to explain why Amida Buddha is explained as immeasurable life. So a common give, uh, commonly given uh, example is that there's two kinds of lives. Um, the first is life uh, that's spelled with a lowercase l, and then the second one is life that is spelled with a capital case L. Okay. So for further distinction, let's call the capital case L great life. Okay. When we live our own individual lives, this is, what, uh, this is the life with the lowercase L. It is a life of egocentricity and reliance on one's own power or, no, or also known as self power. We can live out our entire lives being only aware of this small life. And many people are satisfied with that. But Shin Buddhism is speaking about a greater reality, what we call great life. And this is a life that connects all lives together. And when we become aware of that, we suddenly understand that the focal point of our individual lives was about awakening to the great underlying current that connects all lives. In other words, it is immeasurable life, murio ju, right? It is Amida Buddha, Murio Jibutsu. This becomes the embodiment of true reality that embraces all lives equally. And just to explain what I um, um, talked about here a little bit better, hopefully, I drew a crude, crude um, drawing of, of what I just explained, which is to say that, um, I always forget which one's the pointer here. Does anybody know how to use a pointer here? <laughs> Sorry. Let's see. Okay, well, anyway, um, so uh, just to explain this a little bit better, there's uh, each of us are living our individual lives. 
and uh, we have our life with the lowercase l. And then there is great life, this, this circle that encompasses all sentient beings, right? And then um, each of us, I'm going to explain this a little bit further on, uh, has this negai, uh, uh, right? It's uh, this negai can be read as gang, and uh, gang is um, is what each of us have uh, in our in our in our own small aspirations, right? Which connects us to this great aspiration, and that which connects us to this great aspiration, this heart of great life, is namo amidabutsu. And this is kind of the, the drawing that I'm trying to uh, get at uh, today in, in today's talk. Okay, I don't know why the heart is blue, sorry. I know Valentine's Day is coming up, but um, that was the only color I had. Okay, so I will leave it on this chart. Uh, so when we awaken to great life, we, we then see the significance of our own individual life as a life as well. We become grateful for this life that we have been given. And this, is, this life with a little L, and great life with a capital L is connected through this name, Namo Amida Butsu. When we awaken to great life, we see the significance of our little life. So Amida Buddha then, in this way, is not a separate entity. It is not a deity. It is not some omnipotent being that is separate from us. Amida Buddha is the principle that connects all life together. It's kind of like um, if you could imagine um, each of us being a spigot, you know, when you go camping, you know, that, that dispenses water, a spigot, or maybe like a well, uh, or a faucet that, that dispenses water. Um, there are all kinds of ways in which to draw water, but we are all drawing water from the same source that underlies all the spigots, the wells, and faucets together. The underlying water canal is Amida Buddha, the great life source. So Honggang is translated as primal vow, but I think another way that we can translate this is great aspiration, okay? I'm not, I'm not suggesting that we replace primal vow. I'm just saying that great aspiration can add on to the explanation of what primal vow is. It is the great aspiration because it is the aspiration that all sentient beings have deep within their hearts as well, whether they realize that or not. Um, I, I'll explain more later, but here I want to discuss what great aspiration and uh, great life have to do with each other. So each, each and every one of us has within the depths of our hearts a sincere wish to connect back to great life. The Japanese term negai, which is used here in Honggang, can be translated as wish or aspiration. So for today's talk, I'll be using these two terms interchangeably. Some of us want in life, happiness, peace, truth, equality, freedom, profound meaning, solace, or connection with others. Well, as it turns out, all of these things are addressed in Amida Buddha's 48 vows, or more importantly, that Honggang, the, the, the great aspiration, encompasses the innermost wish which all sentient beings have in life, which is to find meaning in their life with the lowercase l. And this can be done when we awaken to great life, which connects all sentient beings. We all have this deep yearning within our depths, within the depths of our hearts, whether we realize it or not. Many people think that the meaning of life can be found through material gain, through possessions, right? Through power and control over others, or by fulfilling one's base desires. They fool themselves into thinking that this is how to resolve the issue of our innermost wish. But as Shakyamuni Buddha points out, these are all illusions or hindrances to our true happiness. In other words, these are all temporary fixes to our problem. They don't truly solve the problem of our existential plight. The only real way to resolve this problem is to awaken to the truth that answers the call to our innermost wish or aspiration. So Shakyamuni tells us there is an underlying truth that connects all beings. And it is this world that shows us that we are embraced just as we are, despite our attachments. He tells us this through the teaching of the Sutra of the Buddha of Immeasurable Life, also known as the Larger Sutra, which we just discussed. That world of truth is one of immeasurable light and life of Amida Buddha and the Pure Land. It is the great aspiration that envelops the deepest aspiration of all sentient beings, 
which is to awaken to this great life. When we awaken to Amida Buddha's great aspiration, we understand the significance of our little lives, right? So again, Amida Buddha is not this separate entity. It's not a God or an omnipotent being. It's a principle that connects all of us. So great aspiration answers the aspiration that we all have within our, ourselves. And when we join that undercurrent that connects all living beings, we ourselves enter and become one with the great aspiration. So this great aspiration embraces the innermost aspiration that each and every one of us has in the depths of our hearts. It is the aspiration to want to find true happiness, a happiness not just for ourselves, but a, but a happiness for all sentient beings as well. And this is a crucially important point because it is the reason why we come to see the necessity in listening to the calling voice of Amida Buddha. So next, I'd like to move on to the voiceless voice of truth. So the way to overcome this life of suffering is to wake into this Honggang, this great aspiration, right? Next, I want to talk about how Amida Buddha does this. How does the world of absolute truth, the world or the principle of infinite light in life, connect us? And this is where it gets a little bit tricky, because the world of absolute truth is said to be voiceless. So how do we hear the calling voice of truth if it is voiceless? How do we hear something that is inaudible to us? Right? How do we hear the voiceless voice of Amida Buddha? The phrase Namo Amida Buddha expresses that which cannot be expressed in words. Why, might you ask? Because the world of truth transcends the world of our conceptual thinking, and that includes our language. Have you ever had moments in your life when, uh, where your words cannot quite capture or describe the moment you are in? It's like a photograph that you take of a beautiful scenery, but the photograph just cannot do justice to what it is that you're experiencing. I'd like to show you what that um, looks like. There's a picture here, and it's a picture of the, the Ganges River. Um, I went on a um, um, Buseki Sampai, a Buddhist pilgrimage to uh, India and Nepal. And one of the, the, the sites that you go to is the, the Ganges River, right? And um, you go to, we went to go see the Asahi, the, the morning, the rising sun of the Ganges River. And it's when you go there, it's, it's um, you know, there, there are people uh, bathing and there, you know, there's, there was another person next to that person bathing that was, you know, brushing his teeth, I remember. And then there was a person next to him um, that was, you know, washing, you know, their clothes, right? All in this river, river right? And it's all taking place in this river. So the, the river water is very murky, right? Uh, but um, uh, but when the sun comes up, I mean, there is there is nothing like it, really. I mean, this picture, you know, if I was to give a one to a one to ten to to describe its accuracy of the moment of being there, it's probably like a two, right? Um, the the experience is just is very awe inspiring. I can see how uh, many different religions, not just Buddhism, and and all the the sutras of Buddhism constantly make reference to the Ganges, Ganges Sadala, right? the, the Ganges River, because it is such a just uh, uh, inspirational place. But again, you know, it, it doesn't do justice to, to the moment that uh, I was in. I'm sure that all of us has experienced this at one time or another. Uh, and, I, and I kind of want to see what, uh, what you guys have to say about this later on. But um, another thing I wanted to mention was that, you know, as a minister, I have to go on these, uh, you know, makuragyo uh, bedside services. And uh, whenever I go, you know, I'm always in the car and I'm always, you know, struggling to think of what to say, you know, because I, I feel like there's, there's, I'm not obligated to say anything, but I feel like I should say something. But, you know, when you think about it, every time I come to the conclusion, you know, which is that, what, what can you really say? You know, there isn't really, you can say, no amount of words can console or evenly remotely, or even remotely understand um, the, the emotions of this, of the bereaving family, right? So the best thing to do is to not really say anything, actually, um, just be there with the family, right? It's best not to force any conversation. And if conversation does take place, then so be it. But if it doesn't, that's fine too, right? Um, and, and sutra chanting, I think this is why, you know, sutra chanting is, has such a powerful effect on people. Um, I don't think we should underestimate the power of, of sutra chanting. Um, there's really something you know, special about this ritual that cannot be quite explained. It's nothing magical or anything like that, but 
Um, but then again, you know, may, maybe it is magical, you know, based on how you define what magical is, right? But anyway, um, the point that I'm trying to make is that, that, that words are often limiting. And, um, and so it's understandable that the world of absolute truth uh, transcends our limited cognitive parameters of language. Right? So absolute truth is, is voiceless, but the voiceless truth makes itself audible and thus knowable to us through this name, Namo Amida Butsu. Namo Amida Butsu is the expression of the voiceless voice. It is the linguistic expression, a translation, if you will, of the absolute truth. But it's meaningless un unless we understand its significance, unless we understand the meaning behind it, right? And this can be done through listening to the Buddha Dharma. Bruce Lee has, uh, you know, a very famous quote. You know, Bruce Lee, we all know Bruce Lee, right? Don't think, feel, right? Uh, and, and in this context, you know, I, I think that's true, right? The world of absolute truth we have to intuitively feel and connect with. And that connection is expressed to us in words as the phrase Namo Amida Butsu. Namo Amida Butsu is a foreign phrase. It sounds exotic. It sounds mystical, almost like a mantra or something like that, I know. But upon deeper understanding, we see that its content is nothing foreign to us at all. It has and has always been connecting us to the world that always embraces us but we have to understand the feeling behind that phrase, the meaning behind that phrase. Or in other words, we have to understand the great aspiration that is contained within the phrase, Namo Amida Butsu. So absolute truth is conversing with us, but many people don't bother to listen, right? They don't usually respond back. We might be able to understand pieces of this language because it is the great aspiration speaking to all sentient beings, innermost aspiration, but we can't understand it unless we continue to listen. Right? Absolute truth is beyond conceptual understanding, but we humans need some conceptual understanding, some linguistic way to understand this truth. Amida Buddha knows this and provides for us that linguistic connection. And that linguistic expression is Namo Amida Butsu. So I know what I just said was really confusing and muddled. So I, I, I went ahead and took the liberty of trying to draw this out yet again with my terrible drawing here. Um, but um, uh, let's say on the very left here, we have the world of oneness, which I didn't know how to depict other than to draw this square box. So um, it's, it's in the shape of this square box, right? And, and that's basically the conversation that we're having here, right? How do you draw abs absolute oneness, right? Um, but anyway, this for, for, this, for the sake of argument, here is absolute oneness here. It's the world of shunyata. Uh, we don't need to know that now here, but it's also the world of absolute wisdom, absolute truth. It's the world of voiceless. This is what I wanted, um, um, want us to keep in mind here, okay? So this world of voicelessness then is uh, expressed in the form of Amida Buddha, the name in the Pure Land, right? So Amida Buddha becomes the translator and Namo Amida Buddha becomes the, the, the translation, right? It is the world of the Pure Land, the world of concept and language the world of absolute compassion. So this absolute uh, compassion is in contrast to absolute wisdom here, okay? And it is also the world of absolute truth. And if you can note that I also wrote absolute truth in the world of oneness here, um, it's, it's the same absolute truth, okay? It's just expressed in two different aspects. And then here again, we have the voiceless of the, of the oneness, but here in this, it, from Amida Buddha, it is then voiced. And what is voiced is the world of absolute truth. And that becomes Namo Amida Butsu. And that is the great life, great life, okay? So we then hear this Namo Amida Butsu. We are in this world of delusion. We are in the world of concept and language. Note here also that the world of concept of language connects us to Amida Buddha, this, this world of truth. So we have a connection to this truth, but we have to listen to it. And then uh, life with the lowercase l, in contrast to great life with a capital case L. Our own individual aspiration with, a, I guess you could say, lowercase a. And then we have the great aspiration that connects all, right? And then we understand this through uh, language. We can understand through um, this feeling, uh, through the feeling of great aspiration. Okay, so this is how, uh, this is what I was trying to explain uh, uh, up until this point. So if the language of absolute truth is voiceless, 
uh, because it transcends human conceptual thinking, then Namu Amida Butsu is essentially a translation of the language of the pure land. In other words, someone or something translates the voicelessness, and that translator is Amida Buddha. Amida speaks to us through this phrase, Namu Amida Butsu, and the content of that language is the great aspiration. So um, how do we become well-versed in this language? Well, the first step is to learn to recognize and understand it when the world of truth emerges. So the, uh, I was talking about how we have this, this, this uh, uh, the world of language um, that, can't, that connects us to uh, the, the world of oneness, uh, but that we have to, and that is through, that connection is through not the phrase Namo Amida Butsu, but um, you know, just saying the words isn't going to have any significance. We have to understand the meaning behind or the content that's contained within the nembutsu, right? The, nam, the phrase namo amida butsu, which is what I'm trying to say, the hongang, great aspiration, the, the, the aspiration of true reality wanting us to attain liberation, spiritual liberation from this world of suffering. But um, that's uh, not easy to do, right? Uh, to say the least. And so <clears throat> and what do I mean by that, actually? <clears throat> I'd like to give you uh, an example to kind of help show uh, what it is uh, that I'm um, talking about. So I'm going to go ahead and start sharing here. So how do you, uh, for example, express something like love, right? Uh, in other words, if you had to explain um, love to, let's say, a robot or artificial intelligence, you know, how would you explain that? I think um, um, you can make it as complex as you want, or you can make it as simple as you want, right? There are so many different ways to uh, explain and express uh, love. In fact, there are so many ways to, to do that, right? That it's so subjective that you would think that people won't understand each other when they try to explain uh, love to each other. But yet, people can understand the language of love because it's uh, if they if they learn to speak that language, right? If they're taught how to recognize love for what it is, then they can then converse in this language. Some people are not that good at it. Other people are better. Other people are better at it, right? But we all understand love because again, it falls within the depths of our innermost aspiration to find happiness, right? Nevertheless, love is not easy to understand, and I'd like to share with you a story about a situation involving the difficulty of understanding uh, love. It's a story about a family in Japan um, involving three sons. And one day their father passed away and um, he left behind this safe box, right? That was written in his will. So, you know, they tried to open the safe, um, the, the, the three sons, but they, uh, they didn't have a key. And they, so they, they tried different ways to like pry it open, right? Um, and finally, they just couldn't get it open. So they had to hire a professional locksmith. And um, as the locksmith was working on opening the safe, it took a long, long time. So during this time, the three sons got to talking about their dad uh, when they were young children. They reminisced about their days as a family, right? And so they recalled that their fa father was a real hard-headed, you know, stubborn, inscrutable person uh, and very, you know, strict, right? They don't remember him ever laughing, ever smiling, right? And they never went on family trips together. He was a cold, cold man who never showed any affection towards any of his children, right? They felt shunned and turned away from him, and they felt like nothing that they did would ever make him happy. He always left all of the child-rearing responsibilities up to their mother, mother, who has since already passed away. And they really grew to hate him, and they, they just resented him for uh, very much for neglecting to raise them as a loving father should do. <clears throat> so together they began to speculate what was in the safe box, right? And the youngest son said, you know, there's probably a lot of valuable things in there, right? And the second son said he remembers seeing, uh, you know, their dad grinning and smiling in a very Grinchy-like way, right? Yeah, like that, right? And they all believed that, you know, there would be a lot of, you know, uh, uh, of money probably hidden away in that safe box. And finally, you know, when the locksmith, um, he, he was able to get the box open. So the eldest son um, was feeling very excited, right? You know, of what would come out of that safe box, right? So when the son opened it up, uh, what do you think came out first? Was it money? Was it 
gold or was it some expensive watches or anything like that? Well, the first thing that came out was a piece of paper right? and a piece of paper uh, on it said 100%, hyakten manten, right? It was, a, it was a test, right? And the young son, the youngest of the three said, hey, that's my test. I got that 100, uh, I got that 100 a long time ago when I was a little boy, right? What's it doing there? Right? And the next son then came out, uh, the next thing that came out uh, was this certificate of recommendation. So it was a uh, uh, certificate of commendation, sorry about that. And so the second son sees this and he says, hey, that's, that's mine that I received a long time ago when I was a young kid, right? And the next thing that was in the safe box, safe box was a necktie. And the eldest son, as soon as he saw that necktie, he recognized what it was. It was the first thing he bought with his salary when he got a full-time job and started his career. He bought that necktie for his father as a gift to him. There are so many more things in that safe that the father kept of his kids' accomplishments. And finally came out a family picture that everyone took together at the front of their house when the three boys were still children. At first, the son, the son thought to himself, there's no money in here. What the hell, right? But his wife was also in the room when they were looking in the safe box. And she soon understood what was happening and she started to cry. Right? And the three sons realized now what was happening, and they started to cry. And the eldest son remembered all the times that he fought with his father and lashed out against him, and all the grief that he must have caused his father. The son cried and cried in shame for the endless love that was shown to him that he just did not return. But that love was not something that they could understand at first. Right? It is now only after seeing the things that came out of the safe that the children were able to understand what they meant to their father. It is as if the children entered the depths of their father's heart by entering that safe, and they became one in heart and mind together with their father. They began to understand and speak the language of love. So I'm going to go ahead and share back again. Thus, the language of the Pure Land is spoken not necessarily with words. Rather, we converse in it in the depths of our hearts. We can converse with the world around us, with truth itself, by awakening to the great aspiration of Amida Buddha, Honggang. When we awaken to the principle of true reality, that of infinite wisdom and compassion, we now see that we are connected to this truth through Amida's great aspiration. Our heart becomes one with the heart of the infinite cosmos and beyond. And when this happens, we call that Shinji or true entrustment. Love can be expressed in so many different ways, right? Love is difficult to understand in many situations. And in the same way, Amida Buddha loves all sentient beings. But the Buddha's love is limitless, and as such, we call it great compassion. Again, I want to restate that Amida Buddha is not a deity. The Buddha is not some omnipotent being that will grant our salvation or damnation. Amida Buddha is the principle of the universe and beyond. It is the principle of infinite wisdom and compassion. So wisdom and compassion are not desires. It is an unconditional and altruistic principle. True reality wants for all beings to attain spiritual liberation and be freed from the world of suffering. And this is Amida Buddha's great aspiration for all of us. And that's why we call it Honggang, the primal vow. It is the promise that we will awaken to true reality and be liberated from pain and affliction. But it's so beyond what we can comprehend um, that we don't know how to speak this language at first. We can get glimpses of it, but it is very hard to recognize and converse with this world of truth. Nevertheless, we are connected to this truth. Amida Buddha tells us the world of absolute truth is one of light and warmth, of infinite wisdom and compassion. We are all embraced within this world of absolute wisdom and compassion. But like 
bratty little children, right? We lash out. We call it fake. We say BS, right? We disparage and slander it. We say that Jodo Shinshu is a bunch of mumbo jumbo, right? We say things like, oh, I don't believe in that kind of stuff, right? And it's common for people to say this. But that's precisely why the exclusion clause, as mentioned in the 18th vow, is there, right? The Buddha knows that people will not get it at first. The Buddha knows that people will disparage and ridicule this world of truth that embraces them and that their mind, their ego minds, prevent them from accepting this truth. And yet, they are still embraced. And this is why exactly um, Shinran Shonin Shandao and Tanlon saw the exclusion clause to be so important. They saw that the Buddha was speaking precisely about the way people are. People disparage the teaching of other power because they don't yet understand how to speak the language of the pure land. Shoot, other Buddhist schools um, ridicule and slander the, the teaching of other power, right? Because they think it's too easy, right? No self-power practice? That's not Buddhism, right? These people lash out and disparage the language of truth because they think it is useless. And yet, the world of absolute truth is here and it is calling out to us. This is why Shinran Shonin pays no mind to these critics. He became well-versed in the language of the pure land. It's only when we, when we become um, insecure about this teaching, about our own teachings, that we then start to listen to the criticism, right? If we're confident about this, if we know about the language of the pure land, we will pay no mind to the critics and what they say about this teaching, right? Because we're not, after all, we're not saying that other teachings are wrong. We are saying that we have found our path. Shinnan has found his path through the teaching of Tariki Honga, right? And that, so that language is the language of Namo Amida Butsu. But again, the language of the Pure Land is spoken not necessarily with words. Rather, we converse with it in the depths of our hearts. And when we can understand this language, we will always stay connected with absolute truth. And like Muharram, who was moved to tears when he, when he felt understood, we too will be moved to tears when we truly open our hearts to the Buddha Dharma and Amida Buddha's calling voice. You know, I was once told by someone um, who will remain unnamed. Uh, he's not a minister, uh, but um, he, he is a member. Um, but he told me once that a minister should not cry, right? And the reason for that is because Let's say if someone passes away and there's a bereaving family and, and the minister is standing there trying to console them or be there with them. He said that in those times, the minister should not cry because it's a sign of weakness. A minister should stand strong and be a beacon for them and someone uh, and, and, uh, and show them that he, is some, he or she is someone that they can rely on right in a time of need. And reflecting on this memory, you know, um, I cannot disagree more with that person, right? A person who has truly heard and accepted Amina Buddha's calling voice, cannot help but to cry. It is as if you are drowning and someone comes to save you and pulls you out of the water, right? You thought you were finished, so this is how I'm going to go, right? But just in the nick of time, someone comes up and grabs you and pulls you out of the water as you're choking and dying. How can you not feel deep gratitude for the person who saves you, right? How can you not cry? from being embraced and, in, and understood just as you are, right? There is no rejection in this teaching. No one is left behind. Everyone makes it. That's the Bodhisattva ideal. This is Amida Buddha's great aspiration. How can you not cry, right? Crying then is not a weakness. It is true strength. It is recognizing and understanding what is truly happening. Crying is speaking the language of the voiceless voice. We converse with truth when we reflect on life, when we think about our childhood memories and the people who took care of us when we were little, right? When we come across a beautiful setting sun in the West as we go for a walk, or when our child takes her first steps in life and we feel a great sense of joy from that, or when our loved one passes away after living a long, full life. We are constantly embraced in this world of truth, but we have to learn to listen to it, right? It is at the temple, at the various omaeri, 
at the memorial services, the funerals, the Sunday services, the Buddhist seminars, the obons, the fundraisers, this and that, where we interact with the other members of the Sangha. Those are the times when we learn to speak the language of the pure land. And we should aspire to become fluent in the language of the voiceless voice and converse with the world of absolute truth. So I'd like to close with uh, a couple points here for, uh, for today. Thank you. The theme of today is Dharma friends staying connected. So the question is, you know, how do we stay connected in a world, you know, that is increasingly digitized, where we constantly look at our phones and we're in constantly in front of a computer screen. We're relying on cars, machines, and tools that use some kind of computer chip. You know, how do we stay connected with each other? For me, the sooner we learn to recognize and understand the world of great wisdom and compassion by learning to speak the language of the pure land, the more we can stay connected with all other sentient beings. That is true both in the metaverse or whatever verse and here in this real world, right, as well. Why? Because Amida Buddha's great aspiration or Honggang grounds me in the world of absolute truth wherever I might be. The issue of one's spiritual liberation is now much more important than ever before as we find ourselves ever more caught in the stranglehold of the world of delusion. So let us come to embrace Amida Buddha's great aspiration that will anchor us through this unstable, precarious, ever-changing and daunting world of delusion. As Shinan Shonin teaches us, the Nembutsu alone is true and real. And with that, um, I would like to close today. Thank you very much for your attention. And um, I, I totally forgot to open with the opening gasho, but I would like to close with gasho if uh, you don't mind me doing so. Please join me in gasho. Namo Amida Buts. 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 Thank you very much.